Are you ready to embark on a journey through time? Join us today as we unveil the incredible story of the Battle of Jutland, a fierce naval clash that forever shaped history. Another day, another story. The Battle of Jutland. The Battle of Jutland was the most significant naval battle of the First World War. Lasting 36 hours, the battle spanned the 31st of May and the 1st of June, 1916. The battle was fought as an attempt by the German Navy commanded by Admiral Scheer to damage a portion of the British Grand Fleet. The British intercepted the German fleet off the Danish peninsula of Jutland. The battle saw three main phases and resulted in capital ships of both fleets being sunk. Background and Planning German Planning With 16 dreadnought-type battleships, compared with the Royal Navy's 28, the German High Seas Fleet stood little chance of winning a head-to-head -head clash. The Germans therefore adopted a divide-and-conquer strategy. They would stage raids into the North Sea and bombard the English coast, with the aim of luring out small British squadrons and pickets, which could then be destroyed by superior forces or submarines. In January 1916, Admiral von Pohl, commander of the German fleet, fell ill. He was replaced by Scheer, who believed that the fleet had been used too defensively, had better ships and men than the British, and ought to take the war to them. According to Scheer, the German naval strategy should be. On 25 April 1916, a decision was made by the German Imperial Admiralty to halt indiscriminate attacks by submarines on merchant shipping. This followed protests from neutral countries, notably the United States, that their nationals had been the victims of attacks. Germany agreed that future attacks would only take place in accord with internationally agreed prize rules which required an attacker to give a warning and allow the crews of vessels time to escape and not to attack neutral vessels at all. Scheer believed that it would not be possible to continue attacks on these terms, which took away the advantage of secret approach by submarines and left them vulnerable to even relatively small guns on the target ships. Instead, he set about deploying the submarine fleet against military vessels. It was hoped that, following a successful German submarine attack, Fast British escorts, such as destroyers, would be tied down by anti-submarine operations. If the Germans could catch the British in the expected locations, good prospects were thought to exist of at least partially redressing the balance of forces between the fleets. After the British sortied in response to the raiding attack force, the Royal Navy's centuries-old instincts for aggressive action could be exploited to draw its weakened units towards the main German fleet under Scheer. The hope was that Scheer would thus be able to ambush a section of the British fleet and destroy it. Submarine Deployments A plan was devised to station submarines offshore from British naval bases, and then stage some action that would draw out the British ships to the waiting submarines. The battlecruiser SMS Saedlitz had been damaged in a previous engagement, but was due to be repaired by mid-May, so an operation was scheduled for 17 May 1916. At the start of May, Difficulties with condensers were discovered on ships of the 3rd Battleship Squadron, so the operation was put back to the 23rd of May. Ten submarines, U-24, U-32, U-43, U-44, U-C-47, U-51, U-52, U-63, U-66, and U-70, were given orders first to patrol in the Central North Sea between 17 and the 22nd of May and then to take up waiting positions. U-43 and U-44 were stationed in the Pentland Firth, which the Grand Fleet was likely to cross when leaving Scapa Flow, while the remainder proceeded to the Firth of Fort, awaiting battlecruisers departing Rosai. Each boat had an allocated area, within which it could move around as necessary to avoid detection, but was instructed to keep within it. During the initial North Sea Patrol the boats were instructed to sail only north-south so that any enemy who chanced to encounter one would believe it was departing or returning from operations on the west coast, which required them to pass around the north of Britain. Once at their final positions, the boats were under strict orders to avoid premature detection that might give away the operation. It was arranged that a coded signal would be transmitted to alert the submarines exactly when the operation commenced take into account the enemy's forces may be putting to sea. Additionally, UB-27 was sent out on the 20th of May with instructions to work its way into the Firth of Forth past May Island. U-46 was ordered to patrol the coast of Sunderland, which had been chosen for the diversionary attack, 
but because of engine problems it was unable to leave port and U-47 was diverted to this task. On the 13th of May, U-72 was sent to lay mines in the Firth of Forth. On the 23rd, U-74 departed to lay mines in the Moray Firth, and on the 24th, U-75 was dispatched similarly west of the Orkney Islands. UB-21 and UB-22 were sent to patrol the Humber, where, incorrect, reports had suggested the presence of British warships. U-22, U-46 and U-67 were positioned north of Tershaling to protect against intervention by British light forces stationed at Harwich. On the 22nd of May 1916, it was discovered that Saedlitz was still not watertight after repairs and would not now be ready until the 29th. The ambush submarines were now on station and experiencing difficulties of their own. Visibility near the coast was frequently poor due to fog, and sea conditions were either so calm the slightest ripple, as from the periscope, could give away their position, or so rough as to make it very hard to keep the vessel at a steady depth. The British had become aware of unusual submarine activity, and had begun counter patrols that forced the submarines out of position. UB-27 passed Bell Rock on the night of the 23rd of May on its way into the Firth of Forth as planned, but was halted by engine trouble. After repairs it continued to approach, following behind merchant vessels, and reached Largo Bay on the 25th of May. There the boat became entangled in nets that fouled one of the propellers, forcing it to abandon the operation and return home. U-74 was detected by four armed trawlers on the 27th of May and sunk 25 miles, 22 nmi, 40 kilometers, southeast of Peterhead. U-75 laid its mines off the Orkney Islands, which, although they played no part in the battle, were responsible later for sinking the cruiser Hampshire carrying Lord Kitchener, the Secretary of State for War on the 5th of June, killing him and all but 12 of the crew. U-72 was forced to abandon its mission without laying any mines when an oil leak meant it was leaving a visible surface trail astern. Code Breaking British codebreakers had the ability to locate German ships and to read the encrypted messages sent. The Admiralty therefore knew that a German operation at sea was impending. Plans were put in place to take countermeasures. The cryptologists were to be consulted on German positions which would enable the full weight of the Royal Navy to be brought to bear on the German fleet. The codebreakers knew that the German fleet had set sail. The admirals of the fleet and commanders of the ports were not given this news. The GCHQ website explains the reasons for this. Whilst the codebreakers knew that the fleet had left port, they were only asked where the German admiral's call sign was currently situated. The codebreakers accurately stated that his call sign was located at Wilhelmshaven. They were not asked about the fleet or whether the admiral was using the call sign. He was on the flagship and using the ship's call sign. The message sent to British ships was that the German fleet had not left port, they were safe to sortie into the North Sea. This is a case of the wrong question being asked and the answer being misinterpreted. It led to the Royal Navy being surprised and unready when they spotted the German fleet at sea. Interception Plan The fleet was put to sea on the 30th of May in anticipation of the German operation. The German plan to trap the British would be turned into a trap for the German fleet. The Grand Fleet left Scapa Flow into the North Sea. The smaller fleet of battle cruisers commanded by Admiral Beatty also put to sea. The interception plan relied on the two fleets combining, Beatty's ships were no match for Dreadnought-class ships. The misunderstanding of intelligence posed a problem. The Battle of Jutland, Phase 1. Beatty's battle cruisers left the 4th in the early hours of the 31st of May. They soon saw German submarines. The Germans fired on some of the battle cruisers but were forced to dive to evade others. Not realizing that the Royal Navy were sailing in zigzags, they sent information to Shear that the British ships were in a split formation. Beatty, aware that submarines would have been present as part of the German plan, continued to his rendezvous point. The first contact came as the scouting vessels of each fleet saw each other. Hipper's German vessels sighted the British at 3.22 p.m., organized themselves and fired on the British line at 3.58 p.m. Within minutes the German Navy had secured their first hit as HMS Indefatigable was struck. Her magazine exploded and she sank with just two surviving. The Queen Mary was hit shortly after, also sinking with just eight survivors. Beatty rearranged his ships to engage the German fleet more effectively. 
Unfortunately some vessels had transferred from the Grand Fleet and were not aware of the standing orders nor or Beatty's methods when faced with changing circumstances. A consequence of this was that not all British ships would be engaged at the same time in a later phase of the battle. Hipper harried and engaged Beatty's battle cruisers whilst maintaining a southerly direction. This was intended to bring Beatty's battle cruisers into contact with Shear's fleet. The British seemed to have been disorganized at this point. The battleships available did not receive messages for several minutes, meaning they sailed on the a different heading and were out of range at critical moments. The fleet did not fire at the Germans for minutes, even though they were in range. It is thought that there was a delay in altering the fleet's formation into a battle-ready formation. Each of these can have consequences in a naval battle, minutes make a lot of difference. The Battle of Jutland, Phase 2 the German plan to lure the British toward the destroyers under Scheer had worked. At 4.30 p.m. the British sighted the German destroyers. The bulk of the British fleet under Beatty now turned north to evade Scheer's stronger force. The destroyers in Beatty's fleet engaged the German ships, an action for which Captain Bingham was awarded the Victoria Cross as the few British destroyers at this stage were heavily outnumbered. Beatty's plan now mirrored that which the Germans had used to lure his ships toward Scheer. In what is called the run to the north, he turned and made for the Grand Fleet of Jellico. Not all of the line received the orders though, poor signaling left some vessels within range of the German destroyers who engaged them from distance. This small group of battleships endured a pounding as they acted as a rearguard but not were lost. The Battle of Jutland, Phase 3. The two British fleets converged at around 6 pm. The German fleet was also converging. Both sides now needed to know the precise location of the other. Whichever side had this information first had a huge advantage. They would be able to set a formation that brought about maximum firepower while limiting the risk to their own ships. British records show that Admiral Jellicoe was received little accurate information. Based on that and the balance of risks he opted to deploy at 6.15 pm to a line that, if right, would silhouette the German fleet against the sunset. Scheer had no intelligence of Jellicoe's fleet being in the vicinity. He believed that he was facing a smaller force. At 6.30 pm they sailed straight into the full line of British destroyers. Fire was rapid and Scheer quickly realized that his fleet was in grave danger. He turned his fleet 180 degrees for them to evade the Grand Fleet. Soon after Scheer realized that his ships would not be safe in the direction that they were headed. They remained silhouetted. He took the brave decision to turn to the east. This meant crossing Jellicoe's line but offered the possibility of safety at sea overnight. As the Germans reached their weakest point they deployed some vessels to attack the British head-on. The scouting group assigned this tasks undertook what has been termed the death ride to distract the British from aiming at the main German fleet. Despite facing the fire of 18 British battleships and suffering heavy casualties, the ships survived this assault. Fighting during the night was confused and sporadic. The German fleet managed to blast its way through the screen of ships the British had to the north. Messages did not reach Admiral Jellicoe. During the night the British lost five destroyers. The German fleet made her way back to port with few further attacks made by either side. The Battle of Jutland had lasted in the region of 36 hours from the first torpedo to the last. Who won the Battle of Jutland? The immediate aftermath of the Battle of Jutland saw the Germans declaring victory and the British concurring that they had suffered losses. It was several days before the German losses themselves were realized by which time the British public believed the long-for-sea battle had in fact been lost. If the measure of victory is the number of lives lost, or ships lost, then the victor was indeed the German fleet. The Royal Navy lost 6,094 men. 115,000 tons of British ships were sunk. The German fleet suffered the loss of 2,551 lives. 63,000 tons of shipping was sunk. Strategically the Battle of Jutland led to changes. The German fleet did not set sail into the North Sea again, instead concentrating on the Baltic. Scheer changed his approach toward the British by instituting unrestricted U-boat campaigns against shipping going to British ports. The inability of Scheer to damage the British Grand Fleet, it had recovered its losses within a month, meant that Germany had not broken the blockade. This was incredibly significant to the overall picture within the war. 
Thank you for joining us on this journey through the Battle of Jutland. We hope you enjoyed learning about this pivotal moment. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more captivating historical videos.